We'll see the number of participants. Hello, everybody. I'm Carl Silverstein, Executive Director of the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy. We want to thank you today for joining us for this webinar about uh, history and significance of the grassy balds on the highlands of Rhone. Um, it's great to see a lot of friends joining us for this webinar. We really appreciate it. Um, this is uh, SHC's flagship project area and a, a place that we've been so closely involved with for uh, really about half a century now. So um, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce Christy Urquhart, um, uh, my colleague at SHC, who is going to introduce our guest speaker today, Travis Knowles. Welcome everyone. So great to see so many familiar names and faces. Um, thank you for joining us. This is my 30th year at SHC and, and I can't think of a more exciting way to celebrate than to introduce um, our speaker today, Travis Knowles, who is an associate professor of biology at Francis Marion University in Florence, South Carolina. His teaching interests include vertebrate zoology and conservation biology. And he's also the founding director of Wild Sumaco Biological Station, which is a small research and teaching outpost on the East Andes Slope in Ecuador, a place that now I would uh, have found out that I want to go and visit. Um, Travis's research interests include mammal diversity and conservation, especially plant animal interactions, and the role of large herbivore on vegetation structure and community composition. And uh, I just have to say that um, I was so um, thankful to be able to meet Travis and to work with him when he was our Rhone seasonal ecologist. Um, I think he did, he told me three years of Rhone seasonal ecologist work. And the first year was uh, back in 1992 when he was studying um, the conservation uh, biological diversity on their own. So welcome, Travis. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation today and it's so wonderful to reconnect with you. Thank you very much, Christy, and thank you, Carl. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I commented to Christy and Pauline when I first got on today about my fake background. Uh, I really would prefer to be at Rhone Mountain, and this is the best I can do. It's a, a beautiful photograph of, of the Rhone. So I'm going to um, start my screen share and put on the presentation. I think what we're going to do is, uh, you know, I love questions, but I think we're going to go through the presentation that I have prepared and uh, hold off your questions maybe until the end. You can write them in the chat box, but I'll be happy to answer as many questions as I can or tell you that I don't know the answer, which may be true. So let me see if I can make this work. And I hope everybody can see that. Okay. I want to talk to you today uh, about the, the history of these grassy balls. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about human history, but primarily I'm going to talk about ecological history because that's the main focus of my research and interest over many years, but uh, the human history of the balls is a very important component of that history. So I will mention a couple of things about that. So uh, I don't need to tell any of you probably because you're very familiar with the Rhone about these grassy balls and the fact that they represent uh, what has been an enduring ecological mystery for many decades. Um, one of the definitions that's often used that we usually turn to is that of A.F. Mark, who defined a ball as, quote, an area of naturally occurring treeless vegetation located on a well-drained site below the climatic tree line in a predominantly forested region. So um, here's a, a classic shot that I took many years ago of, uh, of a round ball looking toward the top. And you're familiar, of course, with Roan Mountain, but there are probably uh, many of you are also familiar with other grass balls or grassy balls throughout the Southern Appalachians. Uh, here's one of my, my favorite climbs, uh, backpacking over many years of Hunt Mountain. But also here's a, a, an image from White Top Mountain in Virginia, another grass ball. And there are quite a few of these, uh, up to about 90 
that have been described historically uh, from uh, the Southern Appalachians, from Southern West Virginia, all the way down to, to Georgia. So the mystery of these is that they are um, anomalous systems under current climate. There's no, there's no climatically imposed tree line. And if, of course, if you look around, there are trees on all of the other uh, elevations, similar elevations around. And um, so these, the, the origin and the maintenance of these grassy ecosystems has been the, the source of this great mystery. Uh, how did they get there? And then what has maintained them over, over all these many years? We have to acknowledge uh, right away that a lot of these systems that are called balls that have that in their name uh, were, some of them were created for pasture by uh, humans, for, by European settlers, um, or certainly modified after the, you know, European settlers came and brought their livestock. They've certainly, some of them have changed dramatically, but there are some that certainly seem to uh, predate the era of European settlement. And the, the balls at Roan Mountain are a classic example of that. And many of you are familiar with, with some of this historical evidence. So this is some of the human history. Um, balls or bald areas on mountaintops are mentioned in Cherokee legends. I know they're is some controversy and disagreement about the, uh, the actual, uh, you know, whether or not those were stories that were told or they actually represented real landscape features. Um, I think they probably were pretty good observers of the landscape, but we also have a lot of historical documents or a number of historical documents after European settlement in this historical period. And um, this is one of my favorite quotes by John Strother, who surveyed the, uh, the state line there in 1799. There is no shrubbage grows on the tops of this mountain for several miles, say five. The prospects from the Rhone Mountain is more conspicuous than from any other part of the Appalachian Mountains. I think I like that quote so much because it has the word shrubbage in it, which reminds me of uh, Monty Python for some reason. Some of you may know, be familiar with that reference. Well, you know, five miles of open mountaintop with no shrubbage in 1799, that indicates to most of us that, that these balls were found when European settlers came. Uh, there was no record or no evidence, no strong evidence really that either Native Americans or European settlers, of which there weren't that many uh, up until the late 18th and uh, early 19th century, there's no evidence that they created five miles of open mountaintop. Sure, they made clearings, uh, they modified the landscape. Um, Native Americans did burn areas, settlers burned these areas, but I, we think the historical evidence is pretty strong that these are predate European settlement. Uh, and then there's this famous quote uh, by Elisha Mitchell, who was uh, not a person who was slack about measurements and estimates. You may recall that uh, the Reverend Mitchell died trying to take some barometric measurements to confirm the, the height of Mount Mitchell, which is named after him. Uh, here's the quote from 1835 in which he says the top of the Rome may be described as a vast meadow about nine miles in length and so on and so on. Nine miles, five miles, lots of open habitat there that uh, it almost seems certain. Of course, this was by 1835, but, but again, uh, a lot of these records uh, coincide with the conclusion that these open areas have been there for um, quite a long time. Uh, and in fact, uh, recently I rediscovered or read again uh, this little line from John Muir, who actually visited Rhone Mountain. Some of you know about that and know that history. Uh, he ended up at Rhone on the invitation of a friend, a botanist friend from the East. Uh, and he ended up staying at the old Cloudland Hotel and he wrote a letter to his wife in 1898 saying, after lunch yesterday, we walked five miles along the mountaintop to where the storms of winter prevent trees from growing there. So there's uh, pretty good historical evidence that these are, are old systems. How old is the question? And I've been working on that along with my uh, former graduate advisor, Peter Weigel for many years and I'll tell you a little bit of the progress that we've made, we think, in that understanding today. Uh, one of the things that seems to be a pretty strong signature for the antiquity or the old age of these uh, grass bald ecosystems is the pretty stunning diversity of 
plants that require open habitat or sunlight. Um, if these areas had closed over with closed canopy forest, uh, many or most of them probably would not have, have persisted in these places. There's at least 19 species of rare plants. Uh, some are relictual, meaning they're left over from former climate regimes. Some are actual endemics that um, you know, evolved in the southern mountain areas. And the key uh, thing about thinking about this rich community of plants is that they all require these open habitats. They don't persist in shade. They wouldn't be able to persist in shaded over habitat. So I think, uh, and many others now think, the simplest explanation is that these plants have had a long history of uh, open conditions of light that allowed them to evolve and persist and disperse and uh, maintain their populations in these in these grassy bald areas and and associated related habitats. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of the history of the different explanations that people have had of grass balls over many decades. Uh, the way that I've sort of looked at these um, these hypotheses or these ideas is sort of in two camps. There's a there's been one group of people who or fall into what I think of this as the natural factor hypothesis or hypotheses that either it was some uh, effect of long-term climate, AF Mark's classic hypothesis about shifting ecotones as the climate warmed and cooled. Um, severe weather, uh, winter weather has been a favorite explanation of a few people and other things that you see on here. Uh, fire, one of the things we've learned, uh, you know, a great deal about in recent decades is the important role of fire disturbance in maintaining ecosystems in a particular state. And uh, there's no doubt that the balls at Roan Mountain and other places have burned from time to time and the fact that they were burned by people. But the amount of moisture and the mesic or wet climate of the Appalachians argues against fire as being a, a, a truly long-term maintenance factor that can keep out um, the woody vegetation that's now invading these areas. So uh, White and Sutter and a, a paper in 1999 go through all of these uh, hypotheses and find them wanting really as a satisfactory explanation for some of these old bald areas. There's another group of, uh, of hypotheses or, or people who favor a human origin or anthropogenic uh, origin clearing open by Native Americans um, or and or European settlers. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's clear that um, people did clear areas and that some areas were opened up by both Native Americans and Europeans. But again, this uh, landscape pattern of huge miles long open mountain ridge habitat is just not consistent with the known patterns of clearing uh, that would have been uh, practiced by either group of people. Well, one of the clues um, the, about the origins of, of, of ecosystems in the past is the, the recognition of what we call deep time. And this is a, an, uh, a biome or a sort of an ecosystem map of North America 18,000 years ago, and 18,000 years was the maximal extent of the last glacial advance, the miles thick ice that covered huge areas of North America, but also Europe. Um, and this was the, the last uh, glaciation, uh, the extent of it about 18,000 years ago. And uh, various people from, you know, uh, paleobotanists to people who specialize in, in pollen analysis have mapped what a lot of these ecosystems look like throughout North America in that time. And I just want you to notice, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, this orange habitat uh, indicating uh, tundra habitat that was in isolated pockets south of this uh, glacial ice sheet, includes, including this little pocket down here in, uh, in Southern Appalachia. And in fact, uh, this is from a paper by the Delcourts in 1988, uh, where they postulate, uh, they talk about strong evidence for the fact that uh, there, there, there almost certainly was alpine tundra in the high peaks of the Appalachians during the maximal glacial advances. And remember there were uh, 
four or five of these several minor glacial advances over the last two million years, which, which almost certainly repeatedly imposed a tree line where you would have had a level above which trees did not grow on the high peaks and you had uh, habitats similar to Arctic tundra uh, growing there in these past times. So I think uh, the evidence is pretty strong that a lot of the high southern peaks were, were opened repeatedly over the last several million years and uh, forests were replaced and then uh, marched back up as the climate warmed in the periods between the glaciers. So um, one of the reasons that everybody, me and everybody that I, I know about who thinks about these grassy balls and all of the ecosystems at Roan Mountain uh, is their, their interest is really in conservation. And I wanna talk about that a little bit today. This is uh, one of AF Mark's photos, uh, early photos from the 1940s, showing the extent of the grassy bald ecosystem on uh, round bald. So this is up uh, toward, this is the road down here, this would be Carver's Gap would be down here below. And this is from a vantage point back up toward the Rhododendron Gardens or Roan High Knob, looking down onto round bald in the 1940s. What's become increasingly clear to all of us who've worked for many years now at Roan Mountain or have visited there and paid attention is that uh, the balls are disappearing. And in fact, this is a pattern that is common to uh, grassland habitats globally. Um, botanists and plant ecologists and ecosystem ecologists who have looked at the distribution and extent of native grasslands throughout the world are documenting uh, loss of many of these natural areas to woody encroachment, the invasion of, of woody species, shrubs, trees uh, that, that shade out a lot of these grassland ecosystems. And this is a, um, the top here is a, an image that I captured from a postcard. I put a little arrow by that uh, famous set of DM Brown's trees, the Fraser fir trees that were planted at the top as an experiment many years ago. This is the view of, um, of round bald in 1978. And this is a more or less same view uh, with the arrow here representing the trees. And you know, it doesn't take uh, anybody very long to see that there's been lots of advancement of conifer trees, but also additional uh, shrubs, rhododendron and other uh, shrubby ecosystems that are filling in these balls. So, we know that if uh, this process continues and if we don't do anything with regard to conservation, eventually these areas will, will be lost. They will in fact close over. And the conservation imperative for me and many people is uh, maintaining those rich ecosystems of rare plants, unusual plants, uh, which really provide a, a really a living laboratory um, in ecology uh, at Roan Mountain. Um, you know, in addition to the views, which are very important, and the other natural features that people love, this biodiversity has, has for me, is uh, one of, is the key imperative that we need to be thinking about. So back in 1986, uh, my, my former advisor, Pete Weigel, I don't know if he was able to sign on today, if you're there, hi Pete, if not, I uh, uh, hope to see you soon. Um, in a uh, proposal to the Forest Service, proposed this original hypothesis about large herbivores playing a role in these grassy ecosystems, grazing and browsing. And in fact, uh, we know that it both in North America and in Europe and also much of the rest of the world throughout the last 2 million years, there were lots of animals around that are no longer with us. Um, there's a debate about the disappearance of these large mammals, these large grazing mammals. Um, I, the majority of the evidence as I read it today points to at least a very important role in human overhunting uh, in the decline of this uh, and disappearance of much of this what we call megafauna. Megafauna, animals that, that weigh over typically I think about 100 kilograms in body mass. And uh, if you went back just a few thousand years ago here in South Carolina where I live, uh, you'd have been able to see this, uh, this animal roaming around, the Columbian mammoth, which is larger than an African elephant. And uh, during warm periods, I have no doubt these mammals move north into the mountain areas. And in the cold periods, 
Um, a slightly smaller but famous relative of this mammal, the woolly mammoth, was also in the Appalachians. And there were also uh, giant ground sloths, several species. Um, if some of you have been to the Smithsonian in Washington and been to the Hall of Ice Age Mammals, you've seen the skeletons of some of these large ground sloths. They really rivaled elephants in size. These are all herbivores and no doubt they could modify habitats uh, dramatically through their foraging and their feeding habits. Well, there were lots of other herbivores besides the, the large herbivores, the mega herbivores. There were lots of middle-sized animals around too. For example, in North America, here's a partial list. Um, and you can just read through the list there that were around for tens of thousands and some places hundreds of thousands of years. Europe had uh, different species, but a very similar diverse fauna of middle-sized and large-sized herbivores. And uh, we know that these animals were around uh, thanks to very famous cave paintings and cave art from um, Europe and, and other regions around the world. These are just some photos from Wikimedia Commons showing the diverse herds of, of grazing and browsing mammals that were around. Well, we know today that a lot of, from a lot of ecological research, um, Norman Owen Smith proposed uh, what he called his keystone mega herbivore hypothesis in uh, 1989, and which he described the effect of living large herbivores on vegetation in places like Africa. Uh, we know from lots of contemporary research now that large animals, large herbivores have major effects on clearing out woody vegetation, maintaining open areas and different types of habitat mosaics, woodland and grassland. Herbivores play a major role. And um, so Owen Smith in a, this paper extended that back to the Pleistocene in North America and proposed that there were some, some lessons for us from uh, old history of these mammals being around. Now they haven't been around, as I mentioned, for several thousands of years. Most of these animals died out between uh, in, in the in, in North America between 13 and 15,000 years ago, which seems like a very long time, and it is and from a human life scale. A thousand years is a very long time, but it's not that long, really, in terms of ecological or the way we we like to think about as biologists evolutionary time. And uh, I think it's um, not unreasonable at all to view some of these ecosystems as legacy systems that are left over, uh, which probably were formerly much more extensive. In fact, we're learning a lot now uh, from the Southeast about how grasslands were much more widespread formerly, all kinds of grasslands that were maintained by all kinds of different factors like fire, um, edaphic factors in the soil, uh, many other factors that have promoted and maintained grasslands. I just think that the, uh, the, often the role of these giant animals is, is forgotten about or brushed aside or, or ignored because they're not around today. We don't have any direct experience as North Americans unless we are, are, have cattle on pasture about what animals can do with maintaining uh, a certain type of open vegetation. But uh, these large animals certainly were ecosystem engineers, is the phrase we use, that, that we can see the fact that they shape the land today in places like Africa, where they still exist. And there's no reason to assume they didn't shape the land on all the continents previously where they existed. Um, a very important component of human history that comes into play here, I think, is uh, the fact that when European settlers did come, they uh, immediately started using these open areas, the existing open areas, and then of course they created smaller pastures as well for their, for their livestock. And uh, farm animals of various types, cattle, horses, sheep, uh, were grazed on the balls at Roan Mountain for about 150 years uh, from the early days of European settlement. And it's, uh, I think it's important to note that we still have most, the majority of these rare plants around, despite fears that grazing would eliminate some of these things from Roan Mountain. I think there's a pretty strong case to be made that uh, the grazing itself has maintained this diversity as, as we know it does in natural systems 
uh, grazing mammals can do a lot to support uh, the diversity of plant communities. And the only balls that are persisting now and maintaining themselves are, are being kept open by some type of active human management. So um, I think the, un, the, the livestock of European settlers, I've, I've titled them an, an unintended proxy or an unintended stand-in who inadvertently maintained a lot of the processes that may have kept these areas open. And I kind of skipped a step there between the mega herbivores, which died out several thousand years ago, and the European settlers' livestock. We know that in between, uh, there were other middle-sized grazers and browsers around, including things like bison and elk, uh, which can do a lot to also maintain open areas. Bison, uh, through their grazing and wallowing, have major impacts on the vegetation structure where they occur today. There is some debate about the, um, the total area and the density of these animals through time, but we've got a lot of evidence that they were present in the east. And uh, as we've noted all over the years, all you have to do is look at place names around the Rhone, such as Elk River, Elk Park, Banner Elk, uh, to realize that elk were an important part of, of the mountain ecosystems. And there's pretty good evidence that bison were there too. So basically our story that we've put together over recent years is that there's been a, a pretty much an unbroken chain of grazing animals the biggest impacts were lost, of course, with these mega herbivores that died out 13 to 15,000 years ago. But their smaller successors were able to keep some areas open, almost certainly, not as widespread and not as much. I'm sure there was a lot of closure after the big animals were uh, removed. And uh, then after that, uh, at Rhone Mountain and many other areas in the Appalachians, the, the pastoral activities of European settlers maintain some of those same processes. Until today, we're now, uh, you know, there's been no active grazing at the Rhone since about the 1950s when that was stopped, um, when a lot of this property came under the ownership of the Forest Service. And so what we're now seeing is uh, what I call degraded balls or degraded grasslands. Lots of ecosystems are maintained in a, um, a, a state that, that depends on disturbance of some kind, natural disturbance. We know how important fire is now, and, and I've been making an argument along with more and more biologists now that we need to think about these large herbivores as an important disturbance factor throughout history as well. And I put together a little graph here with a sort of a time scale and um, it's a little bit difficult to read, but what I'm showing here is that YBP is, is uh, years before present. So 1 million years ago, 100K is 1,000, 10,000, 1,000 up to the present. So each notch on my scale here is, is decreasing by a power of 10. Uh, that's just a way of using a logarithmic scale so I can squeeze all, all of this data <laughs> onto one, one graph. Well, for millions of years, and certainly all through the last two million years of the Pleistocene, um, all of North America and Europe had huge diverse herds of large herbivores and medium-sized herbivores. They were succeeded the Holocene is uh, some discussion now about um, you know, what, what these boundaries are and what they mean, but the recent period after the last glaciation is what we call the Holocene. Uh, after the disappearance of these large mammals, we had uh, a long period of time with medium-sized grazers. And then about 150 years ago at Rhone Mountain in particular, uh, and, and before that, of course, in Europe, uh, pastoralism with farm animals that graze some of these areas. And at Rhone Mountain, um, about the 1950s, I tried to estimate where that would fall here, the loss of grazing. And that's really, I think, when we, subsequent to that, that we begin to see uh, woody invasion take over and begin and start to close out these grassy areas. So that's a story that I've been telling for some years now, and, and many of you probably are already familiar with it. But I think it's a consistent story that draws on a lot of uh, comparative data. The other thing that uh, Peter Weigel and I have done in recent years is to start looking 
uh, for other systems around the world that may have signatures of the same kinds of systems. And we come across a couple that we wrote up in a paper. Uh, there are grassy high elevation uh, mountaintops in the Oregon coast range. This is a place called Mary's Peak that's just over 4,000 feet up in the Pacific Northwest. This is, these are photos that I took there, oh, more than a decade ago. Very diverse botanical riches on these open ecosystems as well. Farther down, they're also ringed by forest, which is also invading and beginning to close these areas out. They have the same history of, uh, some history of grazing, the same older history of large herbivores around. Uh, we're now seeing these bald uh, systems beginning to close out just as they are in, uh, at Roan Mountain in the Southern Appalachians. This is another picture from Mary's Peak. And uh, another one that Peter Weigel actually uh, read about in some translated scientific literature and actually went over to visit were these systems called Polaninas, which are found in Europe along the Poland, Slovakia, and Ukraine border. And uh, so it's sort of in, uh, in this area right around in here in mountainous regions, there are these mountaintop grasslands called Poloninas. And this is just, I wanted to just show you a couple of pictures. This is one from Slovakia. And you know, the topography looks a little different, the sharpness of the peaks, but it's almost like when I, when I look at this, I can imagine almost hiking over the grassy balls at Roan Mountain. You know, the, the striking similarities in the structure of the system are, are there for anybody to see. So here's one from Slovakia. This is a massive one from a range in the Ukraine. And you can, this is a good perspective because you can see the forest down here, which now is also beginning to encroach and beginning to close these out. These have a much longer history of grazing by pastoral animals than, uh, than the Appalachians do, about 800 years of pastoral grazing in some of these systems. So I'm not gonna read you all of the bullet points in this slide, but, but all of these mountain grasslands have um, communities that are dominated by, by grasses and sedges, no trees, no current tree line there imposed by climate, uh, very diverse plants, herbaceous plants, rare endemic relictual plants, communities of rare plants. They're all south of the same maximal extent of those ice sheets when they came down. Uh, they likely all had tree lines imposed when the glaciers were at their maximum extent down, and they all have some history of pastoral grazing. Uh, and if you stop grazing, we start to see these areas close out. So um, I think the phenomenon that we see at Roan Mountain with the grassy balls is not unique and just isolated to the Appalachians. It's pretty widespread. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about some uh, new research I'm starting up with that here in just a moment. These are just some uh, pictures of, uh, a couple of pictures of some endemic plants. Our favorite, uh, graze lily. Oh man, I love to see graze lily blooming on the grassy balls of the Rhone. It's been a lot of years since I've seen that and uh, I need to catch up with what's happening with them. I hope they're in good shape. Uh, wonderful, wonderful plant. Just love graze lily, named after Asa Gray. And uh, here's an endemic from the uh, Polonina areas, the East Carpathian Monk's Hood. Um, from the Carpathian Polonina systems. So there, there are lots of these and also shade intolerant plants, lots of them that are isolated to these grassy areas. So what we are proposing here is that these mountain uh, grasslands, these high elevation grasslands are sort of ghost communities. They're remnants of systems that used to be, we think almost certainly much more expansive and much more open. And uh, the disturbance of grazing or the disturbance of fire in some areas or different areas is what maintains these ecosystems in this particular state. And uh, I think that the role of grazing animals, large grazing animals and medium sized grazing animals has been um, discounted a lot in a lot of places around the world as, a, as an important maintenance factor. It's not the only factor and for sure, there's a lot of complex interactions between grazing and climate and soils and other things. But um, I'm, I've been a, on a, a little campaign for several years now to just try to get back into people's consciousness the important role of this missing grazing disturbance and how important that is 
uh, worldwide for maintaining many systems. I do want to tell you a little bit about, um, this is a photograph taken by my friend and colleague, Brian Arbogast from uh, an autumn scene from Roan Mountain looking uh, from, I think this is probably from uh, Jane Bald, looking back towards Round Bald and uh, Roan Hainab would go off to the right here. I love photographs from the fall when you can see all of the different trees. You can see the dark spruce fir up here. You can see the Northern hardwoods that are turning yellow. You can see these russet red patches of um, blueberries and other shrubs here on the ball. I'm gonna, I've started working with a number of colleagues on some new projects that I wanna tell you just real quickly about today that I, I hope will bear some more fruit. Um, one thing that I think is a very important concept is uh, a phenomenon that was actually um, first written about to my knowledge in fisheries management. And uh, a fisheries biologist several years ago published a paper about shifting baseline syndrome in which he said that every generation of new fishery managers that, that come online see the, the catch of the time when they come on and assume that that's been that way, that, that baseline is how, how fishing fisheries have been. Well, this isn't a systematic survey, but it's a photo, couple of photographs from a, a textbook that I use of trophy, trophy fishing at the same area in Key West between 1957 and 2007. Uh, and uh, many of you know that, that many fisheries around the world have collapsed due to over harvesting or they're near collapse or they've degraded to the point where they don't support either the size or the diversity of fish that were originally present. So the idea of shifting baseline syndrome is we look at something uh, with our short-term perspective and assume that's how it's always been. And I think that certainly applies to Run Mountain and the grassy balls. A lot of people haven't spent a lot of years uh, observing and taking photographs and looking at them. And it's easy to assume when you go there, this is how they've been uh, for a long period of time. So I think uh, we could do some important work to, to correct that. Um, I'm working with um, several colleagues, Peter Weigel, and also Jennifer Bauer, who many of you know, who published uh, a couple of books about Roan Mountain, and Amy Durenberger, who, is, uh, who published a hiker's guide to Appalachian Balls uh, a few years ago. Uh, we're going to try to work to assemble as many of the historical photos as we can from Roan Mountain, from the Grassy Bald ecosystem, that, that show the changes that have occurred uh, for as far back as we can find photos. And uh, there are a number that have been published, but there are others that haven't been. So we're trying to put together a little introduction to the, for the general public, really, uh, to show how these things have, have changed. And I think we need to make a stronger argument, not only for, for conservation, but also restoration of many of these areas. And uh, having that visual impact of seeing how things have changed is, is quite important. So that's one project I'm starting out on. Another is I'm working with a number of colleagues now internationally to look for additional systems that may be candidate for these same kinds of climate and herbivore explanations for grasslands or open areas that persist uh, interspersed with or above uh, woody ecosystems, woodland or forest ecosystems. This is a photograph from the Shola grasslands from the Western Ghats region of India. And uh, I've been in contact with a couple of colleagues in India who know more about these systems. I'm working with some people in Europe to talk about uh, additional grassland areas there that might be candidates for this, um, for this type of hypothesis. Also in South America, there are a number there. So I'm really trying to begin to pull together a bunch of colleagues that have expertise in these grassland systems around the world. And we're gonna try to put together a summary paper uh, about systems that may be candidates for the activity of grazing mammals over long periods of time. So the more evidence that we accumulate for that, that hypothesis, I think uh, it strengthens the idea everywhere. Uh, this is the last paper that uh, Peter Weigel and I published and a lot of the, uh, the, the, the information, the data that I talked about today are in this. Um, it's a review article. It's in Biological Reviews. Um, I'd be happy to send anybody a, a copy of this paper if you'd like to read it. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of technical 
uh, knowledge to be able to read and, and digest the, the evidence that we put together for, for this hypothesis and in which we talk about Rhone, the Rhone Highlands, but also the Oregon Coast Range and the uh, East Carpathian Polaninias. So if you'd like a copy of this, I'll put my email up here at the end and, and I'll be happy to send you a copy. I wanna uh, go ahead and finish up so that we have time for questions. I wanna thank Peter Weigel, uh, who's now Emeritus Professor of Biology at Wake Forest. Uh, special thanks to Judy Murray, the former Rhone Stewardship Director who hired me as seasonal ecologist many years ago and uh, who's just, you know, for many, many years been a stalwart conservationist and advocate for the highlands of Rhone, uh, including the grassy balls. I don't know anybody who's done more to advance uh, grassy ball, ball conservation and the Rhone than Judy Murray. Thanks to the current uh, stewardship director, Marquette Crockett, who contacted me originally about doing this. Uh, Pauline Hain, and uh, who's made the email contact subsequently, and also Christy and Carl. Southern Appalachians Highlands Conservancy is what a wonderful organization, um, you know, that I love supporting any way that I can financially and otherwise. Um, I have to put a gratuitous elephant photo here at the end. I, this is a photo I took in, in South Africa, but it really shows <laughs> mega herbivores at work on woody vegetation, clearing it out. Uh, people in Africa that know large herbivores uh, say nothing rivals fire more than elephants when it, in terms of, of clearing areas and opening areas up. So this went on in a lot of places. We only see much of it happening in Africa today. Uh, here is my email. Uh, it's very easy, I think, to remember. It's my first initial and last name, tknowles at fmarion.edu. Uh, if you have questions we don't get time to today in the Q&A, or you'd like a copy of that paper or anything else you'd like to contact me about, please do send me an email. I'll be happy to, uh, happy to correspond with you. Okay, um, let me just stop my share. I think I stopped it. Yep, I did stop it. And uh, Christy, are you there? Do you, uh, should I just ask uh, how we're gonna open up Q&A? Oh, you're, you're muted still, Christy. I can't hear you. Thank you. Yeah, there are some questions um, ah, okay. in the Q&A, Travis, I don't know if you've seen those. I haven't. I had the full um, screen on, so I couldn't see yeah. the questions as they came in. Um, you want me to just kind of scroll down through these here? Okay. No, I see. They're, they're fairly lengthy, so it may be okay. better if you, you look at them first before instead of me uh, reading them aloud. Okay. For some reason, uh, I'm only seeing two here. Okay. I see, a, I see one from Joe Melton. Uh, it's like the other side of climate change. Usually we see ice retreating, but here we see forest advancing. That's one of the questions that I see. Joe, uh, yes, it kind of is. Uh, you have to keep in mind that throughout the last 2 million years, there's been repeated cooling and warming as those glaciers march south and then they moved back north. When they moved south, there were cooling periods. When they moved back north, there were warming periods. Uh, but of course, you're right to, to talk about climate change and global warming, which is accelerating warming now at a much more rapid and dramatic rate than anything we saw during those in-between glacial warming periods. So that is a, you know, it's a major threat to biodiversity everywhere. And uh, we're particularly concerned in systems that are what we call sky islands, like the Rhone, that have these unique islands of biodiversity at high elevation. If the climate warms, uh, many of them don't have any place to go except up. So we're quite concerned about the future of biodiversity from global warming. Um, There's another question from Adam Bean. Oh, okay. Um, do you, know. you see management plans starting to shift yet as these arguments for the origin and persistence of the grassy balds have become stronger the last couple of decades? I'm thinking of the been... Smokies decision to maintain only two balds, yeah. Gregory and Andrews, and let all the others go, which they mostly have. Also, yeah. the bald mountains have basically only big ball now. What changes would you like to see happen that aren't happening yet? I see, yes. Um, well, that's, that's right. I mean, we've had uh, a long and very active 
program of management, of course, at Roan Mountain that I and other people have volunteered for for many years, uh, ever since I was a seasonal ecologist there back in the 90s, and even before that. So uh, we have pretty good management at Roan, although there are sometimes conflicting uh, desires and, and you know, ideas that come into play even at Roan. But I would like to see um, the management of grassy ecosystems, at least as many as we think correspond to natural systems that have some plant diversity that are, are remnant or rare plants or light demanding plants. I'd like to see these management ideas spread more widely. And I think the little project that we have, have planned on the photographic history of the Rhone balls, I really wanna focus on Rhone for this idea of shifting baseline syndrome, but I think that can help sort of correct people's historical view of a lot of these grassy bald ecosystems. And I would love to see, I would love to see more active management spread. You know, we're never gonna get uh, herds of elephants <laughs> or even bison back on places like the Rhone, it's just too small. But you can make a very strong case, I believe, and I do, for active human management of removal of woody vegetation and keeping these areas open, keeping the light availability open to these rare plant communities. Excellent. Bring back the mega herbivores. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's a uh, big controversy. There's, uh, yes, there's I whole, know. There's a whole... Uh, school of thought about rewilding and there's mm -hmm. even some I think probably still fairly fantastical ideas about cloning woolly mammoths yes uh, I, don't, I don't think they'll ever get a real woolly mammoth the experts that I've heard talk about this say that it's there's enough genetic material that could probably um you know make a, a an elephant relative that's more like a woolly mammoth that has long hair for example and some of the other features but um, you know, some of that's really out of the realm of management that we can think about at okay. places like the Southern Appalachians. But I would love to see as many um, native herbivores and carnivores restored to the land as possible. You know, we have opportunities to do some of that on a smaller scale through much of the Southern Highlands in national forest areas. You know, elk are back now in the Smokies yes. and also in Kentucky and other places. Um, it's just... Um, it's difficult now because there are a lot more people and a lot more landscape changes and people who live around these areas that make uh, maintenance of wild free roaming herds difficult, except in the largest areas. We have another question from Joe Melton. Um, he's wondering why the big herbivores seem to clear the top of the hills and mountains instead of the lower plains. That's a great question. Um, can I, I'm going to just pop a slide back here, maybe up here again. I anticipated correctly that someone might ask me that. Uh, let me, let me put my slides back up here for just a moment. I want to show you uh, a little conceptual model. And in fact, that's a great question. You know, if, if grazing is responsible for maintaining these grassland areas, why are they, they only on the mountaintops? And why are they uh, isolated from each other and, and really kind of small areas today? You know, we've, we've been proposing that landscape scale grazing and browsing over large areas, maintained open areas, how come there aren't more widespread? Uh, so why aren't they more common? So I think, you know, I mentioned, I said when the, the megafauna went out 13 to 15,000 years ago, those are huge, uh, ecosystem engineers that keep areas open. So there no doubt was a lot of closure of forest after those large mammals left. And then we had some herbivores left around, but it was much diminished in terms of the, the diversity of species and at from time to time, the density of the herds. So there's subsequent closure of a lot of formerly open areas. I think this is a, a very reasonable assumption to make. Another thing that, as, that I've become aware of in recent years, uh, in, the, in the northern latitudes, uh, many ungulates, many cervids, for example, members of the deer family, but other ungulates where you have seasons that alternate between cold and warm, these animals tend to move up in, in, uh, in the summer, the spring and summer. They're following the nutritious browse, the greening browse that's, that's emerging higher and higher up on the peaks. So, 
this is a conceptual model and I've, I've tried to find some people who can help me do a little bit of computer modeling or simulation modeling to model this. And I'm, I'm also still have that project in the back of my mind. I think it's pretty reasonable to think that if you went back 18,000 years ago, uh, there were a lot of open areas and not just in the mountains, but farther down in elevation and all throughout the Southeast uh, that were the result of climate clearing and large animal grazing. And then as these areas closed and closed and closed, it makes sense to me that some of the last areas that would be maintained by middle-sized herbivores and then found by settlers would be these mountain peaks. The yellow arrows represent the tendency of these animals to move up and slope during the, the, the summer. So you think about that, you've got small areas, the mountain is you know, almost like a cone shape with a short growing season, uh, only a few months where you really concentrate grazing on top of those areas and uh, I think that could, I just did like a little uh, conceptual simulation here. If you're looking down on two mountain peaks, if the yellow areas here are my cartoon uh, <laughs> made up open ecosystems with grassy you know, systems or grass and woodland interspersed that were much more widespread, that subsequently through time, as you lose these grazing animals and as climate changes too, climate's an important factor, more of these low elevations fill in with woody vegetation until you're left with some of these just few remnant populations of uh, grassland and grassland species, grassland communities on scattered mountain peaks. So uh, that's a uh, admittedly a, um, a conceptual model, but it's one that I think uh, makes some sense. All right, let me close that out. Okay, did I successfully? No, stop share. There it is. All right. Thank you, Travis. We have another question. Are you familiar with the wild pony herbivory in Grayson Highlands? And has that made a substantial impact on reducing woody vegetation there? I guess also yeah. like where other wild ponies yeah. maybe graze. Um, I, I don't know for sure. I'm familiar with those wild ponies. I, I saw them many years ago, uh, early on, you know, when I was in college, very quickly, my two favorite places to backpack were Roan Mountain and the Grayson Highlands. And uh, I'm from Virginia originally, but also from the, from the Blue Ridge, but farther east. So I know those ponies are there. I, I don't know if anybody has looked at impacts that they have on the vegetation. I don't know anything at all about the density of, of, those, uh, of, of, of those ponies, whether it's dense enough to really have an impact. I really haven't followed that. Um, there's, you know, horse grazing in North America is quite controversial. Uh, we haven't had horses for a long time uh, in North America until the conquistadors brought them back, you know, with the Spanish settlement of North America. But, if you go back a long time, horses evolved in North America, and we had horses all throughout North America for a long, long periods of time. Um, but today, there's, they're very controversial, especially horses out west, where they can, um, you know, definitely cause damage to ecosystems if they become overpopulated. Um, so, I think horses worldwide are a part of the natural grazing fauna, and uh, it's interesting to look at those as a component of grazing to help maintain ecosystems as a tool to help ma maintaining ecosystems. But I don't have any data at hand. I haven't read anything specifically about ponies or horses in doing that. Do you know that if uh, trees that are intentionally planted on balds grow at a normal rate? Uh, yes, they do. In fact, uh, if you remember, I, well, I don't know if they grow at a normal rate. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of things that probably also helped inhibit woody vegetation returning onto the grassy balls after they, their origin and after they were grazed and maintained by a combination of factors. There are other uh, environmental factors that make it more difficult for woody vegetation and, and trees to come in. Uh, the thickness of the sod, for example, if you have very thick grass and sedge, uh, makes it more difficult for tree seedlings to get their roots down and get started. Mm -hmm. But we know that they are invading, as I, as I showed you in, in the uh, slides, and that they will close it in. Typically, it starts out with often not with trees, but it may start, it can start with trees. It may also start with shrubs. It can start with very, very dense thickets of blackberry, which uh, many of you know about, which 
you know, grow into canes bigger around than my thumb and taller than me that completely shade out everything. I spend a big focus of management is removal of these black, you know, these solid blackberry okay. stems. But you remember the little uh, photo of trees that I had that I said are um, D.M. Brown's experimental forest of Fraser First. He planted those up there specifically to see if they would grow. And in fact, they do, and they're still there. But you just look all around now and you can see more firs, um, more conifers yes. popping in. So it's clear that they're gonna go. Thank you for answering that. Here's a, here's a great question, and it's one that we get a lot of these questions every year and one that you're very familiar with in terms of the schools of thought there between do you, um, how do you justify managing the balds and, and that interferes with the natural process? Yes, uh, that's a great question. And it's, um, you know, the, the entire field of, of conservation biology has to deal with that question because, uh, you know, I remember years ago when I worked on the, the balls at Roan Mountain, mm -hmm. uh, we were using tools to open up some of the bald areas. And from time to time, we'd have a hiker or somebody who asked that very question. You know, uh, nature's natural succession is closing these balls out. How do you justify keeping them open? Uh, you know, um, you know, why are you interfering with nature with a natural system? Well, thinking about this from a long-term perspective, just taking the balls at Roan Mountain as an example, um, humans are largely responsible for the removal of the disturbance factors that I think kept these areas open. Uh, both in the, the end of the grazing mammals, the large mammals of the Pleistocene, and also in the decision to cease grazing or remove grazing from public lands at Rhone in the 1950s. So, um, you know, you, you can certainly make it, conservation is a lot about values, isn't it? It's, it's what we want. If we want all of the bald areas to close in, it's easy to do, all we have to do is do nothing. But the, the ethical imperative for me and many people, again, is the diversity, these rare plants, some of them unique, certainly a unique combination or community of plants that have been there for a very long time. Uh, I think we owe it to that biodiversity as well as our, ourselves to correct changes that we've made to the landscape and try to maintain those. That's my personal view. I know a lot of people share it, uh, some don't. But that's often the case in conservation biology. You know, humans have altered the world so widely and in such fundamental ways that we now find ourselves having to clean up what we've done or try to clean it up as best we can and repair the damage, both in the past and that's ongoing today. It's a great question. We get that question a lot, especially since we're doing hand management. Um, yeah. as, as part of our toolkit on the right. road every year. And I guess a simple uh, bullet point to that would be uh, that, that we think, uh, I think, and many of us think, the reason these balls are closing in is human interference in the past. Mm -hmm. you know, we're just trying to correct the mistake that we made. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, they wouldn't be closed out had we not interfered with the natural disturbance processes that kept them open. Are the Rhone grassy bald ecosystems similar to those at Shining Rock Wilderness or Max Patch, or were you know, those I'm, created by yeah. different means? I, 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 you know, I know that uh, Shining Rock probably has a history of fire, massive fires there that mm -hmm. I that I seem to recall reading from years ago. The forest vegetation never quite recovered from. So there are differences. I mean, they're similar in in the uh, in in the respect that they're open to sunlight. But um, one of the unique things, the most unique things about Rhone is again, is this uh, rich rare plant community assemblage that occurs there that doesn't occur in all of the other systems. But it's hard to, it's hard to, to go back and know how much even those systems have, have changed through time, like places like Max Patch. Mm -hmm. um, some of, the, they may have already lost a lot of things that were there. We have historical evidence that some things are already being lost at Rhone uh, that used to be present in the in the botanical collections from there. So things change. Uh, they're not the same, but um, you know, I think there's a lot of hope for restoring grassland ecosystem area 
that plants can begin to spread into again and reestablish some of their some of their lost populations. There might even be a role for conservation relocations, which is a you know translocations of moving some assisted migration of moving some plants mm -hmm. around if we can be sure that they were an original part of the flora and fauna there of putting them back. So this is a big area called restoration ecology. And I think it's, uh, it's one of the great works of the future for us is to try not only to just conserve what we have left, but try to restore. Uh, we're not gonna be able to restore everything, but let's do as much as we can. Speaking of original flora and fauna, Brian McLean would like to know um, if you can elaborate on some of the other endemic species on the Southern Appalachian balds. Uh, well, the endemic species that I know about are uh, primarily plants. And uh, hi, Brian. I think I know who Brian is. Um, I can send you a, a paper that that paper, if you'd like to have it, that lists the plants at Road Mountain plus the other two grassland ecosystems. And it, it shows which are likely endemics, but also which are relictual that just are hanging on in open space that remains uh, and, and which are rare. So the endemic species to the Appalachians that I know about are mostly plants. There are certainly are some um, animals that have small ranges. Uh, I don't know of any that are quite endemic to uh, grass balls or only found in grass ball areas, but there are certainly some that thrive there. And there are very diverse communities of small mammals and salamanders and other things that are also found in these areas. Um, there's a small mammal called the yellow-nosed vole, which is, has, has been found in the grassy areas of Rhone Mountain and the Rhone Highlands. So it's not endemic to the Rhone Highlands, but these open areas provide vegetation and habitat for maintaining a collection of species, not just endemics, but, but lots of other unusual combinations of flora and fauna that I think are worthy of keeping around. So George Norson would like to know, why do higher peaks like Mount Mitchell and, uh, and others in the Smokies not have balds? And why would balds persist on the Rhone Highlands and not taller peaks that were just as likely to have had tundra ecosystems during the Ice Age? Okay, yeah. Well, I, I partially tried to answer that question with a little model about how uh, I think it's almost certain if you go back far enough in time, there was plenty of open area on Appalachian, Southern Appalachian mountaintops that had tundra. That, I mean, the evidence is pretty strong that they, they would have. And I think a lot of that has closed out. Why did some areas stay open and other areas closed? It's speculation to try to think about why that might be. Um, it could have some things to do, for example, with the availability of water nearby for large animals. It could have things to do with, uh, I spoke, I gave a talk about this paper at a conference in uh, England a few years ago, and John Turborg, the ecologist, was there. And um, he said to me something I'd never really thought of. He said, you know, the, the Rhone Highlands with that long ridge of several miles that would have been open is uh, it may, he says it makes a lot of sense to me that that area would have been favored as longer than many other areas for grazing. For a lot of grazing mammals, if you have a single peak like that with an open area at the top, uh, he said that would become a death trap in trying to escape predators that are coming up and, uh, and get you on the top. So we don't know for sure. Uh, there's a lot of historical factors that we, at the fine grained detail of history that we can't recover. We don't know why, but I think it, the general model is that as you suggest, there were other mountain peaks that were certainly open that had tundra vegetation. And some of those closed in, others not. Um, I think the ones that didn't close in had some combination of disturbance factors, including grazing, which is often ignored, uh, that come into play in maintaining their little remnants, admittedly, of what was once more widely uh, spread. Excellent points. Laura Bogus um, has a rare plant question for you, Travis. Uh -oh. I'm going to be in um, trouble. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Laura. <laughs> hey, Laura. Um, is the, the aconitum on Rome the same as species that are found in the Carpathians or closely related? Uh, it's in the, I think it's a different species. Don't hold me to that. Uh, I know we have aconitum in uh, the Appalachians too. I think they're different species. Uh, they, it must be because. Um, 
that's listed in the literature that I came across as an endemic for the Carpathians. So it must be a different species, but same genus. So uh, certainly closely related. And I don't know if Marquette is still on the call as a panelist, but she may have some things to add in. Um, Ken Klein would like to know what's the Forest Service stance on possibly reintroducing grazing on the balds? Um, That's a great question and I don't know the answer to it. Can anybody in SAHC have any insight into that? I don't know. I don't know if folks remember when we uh, were in partnership with the Forest Service on the goat grazing that happened on the Rhone with uh, Jamie Donaldson. Um, there may be some other folks on the call that can answer no, that. I, I don't know what current thinking and current policy is with mm -hmm. regard to that. I don't know. You know just, if, you want, if you want to Marquette, are you available? I think I, I think can, I think I just became a panelist. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the plan is after the forest plan is finished, which is sort of laid out the number of acres that they're going to shoot for for grassy balds, then the environmental analysis, which is from the 80s, will be redone. And as a part of that, they'll be looking at all the different tools in the toolbox for management and practicality, including, you know, grazing and mowing and all the, all the tools. Um, so we look forward to, uh, to that assessment and, and seeing what they come up with moving forward. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. I think I answered the question. Someone let me know if I missed one. Carl, I don't know if you're checking them as well but as he's checking on that I would like to extend just a huge thank you Travis um, not just for today's talk but for your ongoing uh, membership and support in the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy and I would encourage those on the call that aren't yet a member to please join um, we really have enjoyed having these virtual events and um, as a way for just to, to just check in with some educational opportunities. And it's a wonderful way to have a lot of people, right, uh, at a conference. So thank you. It's, my, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Thanks so much, Travis. I just wanna add my thank you. Um, you presented that in such a clear, way that I think we all learned uh, a lot and um, appreciate everybody who joined us today for the webinar and stay tuned. We'll have others this week and going forward as well. But uh, for today, I think we're wrapping up. And uh, again, Travis, thanks for this and for all you've done for our conservation work. It's a pleasure. Thank you all. And remember to uh, join in the rest of the June Jamboree opportunities this week. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.